Welcome to Unit 7, Inference for Quantitative Data, with emphasis on means. This is topic 7.1, which is an intro to this brand new unit, and we're also going to talk about why should I worry about error, and at the end of the video, that'll actually make sense to you. So, the idea of this unit is it's all about quantitative data, and making inferences based on quantitative data. So, let's first talk about what quantitative data is. Recall, quantitative data are measures of values, or counts, that are expressed as numbers. So again, we're thinking values, measurements, or counts that are expressed as numbers. Quantitative data are about numerical variables, such as how much, how many, or how often. These numbers can have units if they're measurable or can be counts of something. For example, if you're measuring the weights of lions, that's going to be in pounds, kilograms. I guess you could even do grams if you wanted, right? Um, or it could be counts of something, like maybe I count how many lions are in this particular square mile, and I count how many lines are in this particular square mile. It could also be counts. The, the point, though, is that they're numbers, right? Quantitative data, when you collect, it's numbers. Remember, we just got done with the whole unit on proportions, and with proportions, the data you collect come in form of words. So you ask somebody, oh, do you eat cereal every morning? Yes or no? Okay, so you're going to get a bunch of answers back. You have a bunch of yes or no's. Those are numbers. Or I'm sorry, excuse me, those are words. And when you're, when you're working with words, Really, the only value that you could get is the proportion. You could say, okay, how many, what proportion of yeses did I have? So when you're working with numbers, when the data is coming back to you in the form of numbers, that's quantitative data, right? Okay. The other thing that's super important is that it needs to make sense with any quantitative variable that you could calculate and discuss the mean of those values. So if I select a bunch of lines, it needs to make sense for me to talk about the mean weight of those lines. Or if I select a bunch of students, it needs to make sense that I could talk about their mean IQ score maybe. Or if I, you know, catch a bunch of fish, it makes, it makes sense that I could talk about their mean length. Even if I collect a bunch of bags of candy, it would make sense that I could talk about the mean amount of candy in each bag. And again, that would be a count. But it would still make sense to say, hey, you know, I got 100 bags. The average or the mean is 22 candies per bag. So those are still numbers that it makes sense of a mean. There's very few examples of quantitative data that doesn't make sense of a mean. But one of the most famous ones is zip code, right? You would never add a bunch of zip codes together and divide to get a mean. Because actually, zip codes are categorical data. Yes, it's a number, but there's no units. They're not a measurement. It's not like somebody measured a city and go, oh, the zip code is this because we measured it. No. And it's not a count. A zip code's not a count of anything. It's literally just a number that tells your post office, you know, where to send your mail to. So it's really just a categorical variable. But again, that's a very rare example of a, of a number that's, that's actually categorical. So when you're working with quantitative variables, it's got to be a number. It's got to have a unit or a count of something. And it's got to make sense to find the mean. All right. Now, when you think of quantitative variables, there's really three things that you should think of. The first is there's going to be a mean and there's going to be a standard deviation of the entire population, right? So this is mu and sigma. Those are the symbols that we use here. Now, let me make sure you understand this completely. These numbers are really hard to find because let's talk about lines, for example. And let's talk about the weight of lines. If I wanted to know the true mean of the entire population of all lines, I would have to capture every single line in existence, measure their weight, put them on a scale, add them all together, and then divide by how many there are. That's the only way I can get the true mean. So sorry, this value is going to be really difficult to find. Now remember, standard deviation is attached to this number because standard deviation is how far a typical line is from the mean. So I would need to first find the mean for me to calculate the standard deviation that tells me how far typical lines are from the mean. Because obviously some lines are going to be over the mean, some lines are going to be under the mean. It's just part of the world. But again, <laughs> sorry, those two numbers are going to be really near impossible to find. Unless you have a very small population, right? If there's only 10 lines in the entire world, then yeah, I could get that. But that's not the case. All right, the second thing is that we could find the mean and the standard deviation of a sample. Now, it's important that the sample is going to have a different size, right? Let's just say that, you know, let's try to be somewhat consistent here. Let's just say we're going to look at 15, a sample of 15, okay? And then I, I have to select that population, or I have to, excuse me, I have to select that sample from the population, right? So if I want to go ahead and get a sample 
of 15 lions. Well, I'm not going to go look at tigers. I'm going to go look at lions. Right? I'm going to go to my lions. I'm going to get a sample of 15 lions. Now, this is a small sample, 15 lions. That's not that many. I could easily calculate their sample mean X bar. How would I do that? <coughs> Excuse me. It'd actually be pretty easy. All I would have to do is add up all their weights, divide by 15, and I'd get the mean. And then S would be the standard deviation of that sample. So whereas, let's make sure we slow with this. Sigma up here, that's the standard deviation for any one line in the population. S is the standard deviation for any one line in my sample. So here, S tells me how far away a typical line is from the mean in my sample. Now, the formula for that's a little bit tricky. So honestly, I'll be honest with you, we usually have the calculator find these values for us. And let me kind of demonstrate that. I think it's worth um, me taking the time to show this. All right, so on your TID4 calculator, the first thing you have to do is <laughs> enter in your lines. So I'm going to hit stat, edit, and let's just say I went ahead and found 15 lines and I measured them. So in list two are my values. So I had a line that weighed 526 pounds, a line that weighed 527 pounds, and so forth. Right? I'm not going to bore you by reading off all these numbers. But I have 15 measurements, 15 numbers in my list. Now, notice I use list two. So to find the mean of my sample and the standard deviation, it's actually quite easy. Now, this is going to avoid me doing the work, right? Why not let the calculator do the heavy work for me? You're just going to hit stat, set over to calculate, one variable stats. Now, make sure the first thing you do is select the list your data is in. If you remember, my data was in list two. So I'm going to hit second, number two, to get list two. Leave the frequency list blank. We never put anything there. Um, that is... You know, if there's a probability attached, which there's no probabilities attached here, we did that back in the probability unit. So make sure if anything's there, you clear it out. And then just hit calculate. And bingo, how easy is this? I didn't have to do any work besides entering the data into my calculator. So the mean of my sample is 522. And then S right here, the standard deviation of my sample is 48.721. Now, I want to make a really important comment here. The sigma underneath S is not the sigma you're thinking of. It is something completely different. So to be quite honest, don't ever look at that number. Don't ever. That's not, there's no way that the calculator could find the standard deviation of all lines based on looking at only for, uh, at 15. So please ignore that, right? That is nothing that you need. Now, if you scroll down, you can get the min, the max, the median, Q1, Q3. We learned all that way back in unit one. But right now we're talking about means. So that'd be the 522 and the standard deviation of 48.721. All right, so the point I'm trying to make overall here is that mu, not going to be possible to find with large populations, but your mean, X bar, yeah, you could do it. Sigma, not going to be able to calculate with large populations, but you could find the standard deviation of your sample. All right, the third thing that we could do when we talk about means is we can understand a sampling distribution. Because remember, this was just one sample, but how many samples of 15 lines are out there? Um, I'm going to venture to say probably hundreds of thousands, possibly millions. There's got to be tons and tons of different samples. Remember, if I replace one line with a new line, got a whole new sample of 15. So there's got to be tons of samples out there. So what a sampling distribution does is it makes a picture of all those possible sample means. So for all those possible samples that are out there, every single sample is going to create its own mean. And we know that one thing is going to be true, that those means are going to vary. But if we think about the mean of those many, many, many means, so the, the symbol actually makes complete sense. It's a mean of means. The mean of all those many thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of means, well, it should be the truth, right dead in the center. Obviously, some samples are going to be a little higher than the truth. Some samples are going to be a little bit lower. But once we take a look at all possible sample means from all possible samples of size 15, the truth, the true mean should be right smack dab in the center. And then we also have the standard deviation of those samples. So again, slightly different symbol here. It does use a sigma. So it's talking about the standard deviation. But then we got this subscript here. It's talking about the standard deviation of a bunch of means, not one, a bunch of means. And to do this, um, we're going to take the standard deviation of the population sigma and divide it by the square root of our sample size. Now, we've already explained all this back in Unit 5. But I'll quickly explain it one more time. The idea is that, you know, one lion could deviate a lot from the mean in the population or even in a sample. 
But and you're talking about a sampling distribution, you're no longer talking about one line, you're talking about a group of lines, you're talking about a group of 15 lines and the mean of those 15 lines. Well, a group of 15 lines on average mean will be a lot closer to this to the truth. So that's why when we divide by the square root of n, we're shrinking our standard deviation for the sampling distribution because we're no longer talking about a single line. That's the number on top. The number on top is talking about the standard deviation for one line. We're dividing it by the square root of our sample size. So now we're talking about how one sample of lions will deviate from the mean. Now, the only hiccup is this. Well, remember, uh, it's pretty hard to find the, standard, the, the mean of a population. Pretty difficult to find the standard deviation of population. So typically, I can't even build a sampling distribution because I would need to know those values. <laughs> so really, the only thing I could actually go out into the world and get pretty easily is X bar, the mean of a sample, and S, the standard deviation of a sample. All right, let's talk about one more thing in terms of means. Let's talk about the shape of our distributions. So let's talk about the shape of a population. All right, to be honest, a population distribution can take any shape. Let's go back to my lines. What do all lines look like? What is the distribution of all lines? Well, um, I don't think any lines weigh zero pounds, but um, you know, let's start at maybe 50 pounds. Maybe there's some really, really malnourished lines. And, and I don't know, there could be some really huge lines. I don't know. Maybe a line could weigh a thousand pounds. Okay. So what would the distribution of all lines look like? Well, one possibility is skewed to the left. So maybe there's a lot of really big fat lines and very few small lines, or um, maybe it could be skewed to the right where most lines are really, really tiny actually. And there's very few really big lines um, or you know, heck, maybe it could be pretty normal where most lines are full somewhere in the middle, very few that are really small, very few that are really big. Um, but you know what's possible is maybe even something more different. Like, um, for example, maybe it's something like bimodal, right? Where we kind of see two humps. That has, this actually might make a lot of sense because maybe we'll see all the female lines kind of hover down a lower value and we'll see all the male lines kind of hover around a higher value because, you know, male lines probably typically weigh a little bit more than female lines. So, you know, the idea is that the shape of the population could honestly be anything you want. Now, what about the shape of a sample? Well, typically a sample will reflect the population. So if your population is skewed left or skewed right or normal, then guess what? So is any one sample taken from that population. Now, understand the law of large numbers. The bigger your sample size, the more clear your sample will look like that population. I mean, if you only look at two lions, well, that's going to be a pretty boring graph and it's going to be probably a histogram with one bar. So the idea is that, you know, the bigger the sample, the closer that the sample will reflect exactly what that population looks like. So if a sample is skewed right, chances are the population is skewed right. Sample's normal, chances are the population is normal. And it also works vice versa, right? If a population is skewed left, great chance the sample is going to be skewed left because that's just what samples do. They reflect their population. So let's actually take a peek at this real quick. Remember, we entered in all the data for our 15 lines into list two. Let's take a look at what my sample looks like. Now, again, we haven't done this since unit one, so it's probably worth us taking the time to do it real quick. It's actually pretty easy to create histograms on the, on the uh, calculator. All you got to do is hit uh, Y equals first. I always suggest hitting Y equals first just to make sure there's nothing typed in there. Maybe you did something in another class. Once all the Y equals are cleared, hit second Y equals to go to your stat plots. You're going to turn plot one on just by moving it to the on. Then you're going to select the little histogram looking box here. Uh, pretty obvious which one that is. And then the other thing you got to do is, you know, make sure you tell the calculator where your dad is at. Remember, I typed my lines into list two. So second list two. All right. Then once you have all that set up, you could go to Zoom, and there's a special Zoom feature, Zoom 9, that only focuses on zooming in on where your stats are for anything that uses the stat button, which is, of course, where I entered my lines. So hit that, and boom, you got a nice picture of your data. Now, let's talk about this picture real quick, right? Um, I don't see any major skewness. I see a little fall to each side. And I say major skewness, I mean major skewness. I don't see any major outliers either. You know what? This actually kind of looks symmetric, maybe even normal-ish. So if I had a guess, based on only 15 lines, what the population looks like, I'm going to say it's probably pretty normal. 
but that's because my sample looked normal. And remember, a sample is going to reflect its population. So that makes complete sense. If my sample of lines looked majorly skewed right, well, then I would probably be pretty accurate to say that the population of all lines is also skewed right. All right, finally, let's talk about the shape of a sampling distribution. And I hope you remember this from Unit 5. That shape should always be normal, regardless of what your population looks like, regardless of what any one sample looks like. Sampling distribution should always be normal. But we do have to make sure one of two things. Either our sample size is 30 or larger. And that's the central limit theorem. Central limit theorem says, hey, have no fear. If your sample size is 30 or larger, the sampling distribution for a mean will always be normal. Otherwise, if you're under 30, you do need to make sure that your population is somewhat normal. It doesn't have to be perfect, but somewhat normal. Now, remember, it's really hard to know anything about a population, but you can infer, right? So this is what we literally just did. We took a look at our sample of lines and we saw, hey, it kind of looked normal-ish. It wasn't terrible. It was kind of symmetric. So I could only imply that my population is also going to be normal. So even though my sample size is only 15, not larger than 30, I'm pretty confident the sampling distribution is still going to be normal-ish. Again, because my sample looks normal-ish, hence the population is probably normal-ish. Okay? So that's pretty easy to understand. So at the end of the day, you know, the, the only thing that's really we can literally do very easily is work with our sample. We can find the mean of our sample, we can find the standard deviation of our sample, and we can even make a picture of our sample shape. So what this whole unit is about is taking the information that we can gather from a sample and trying to make some type of inference to the larger population at hand. So we could do this with four things, and all four of these things should sound very familiar because they come from what we actually just did with proportions. First, we could find a confidence interval to estimate the mean of a population based upon one sample taken from that population. So I could take my one sample of lines and I could build a confidence interval for what might be true for the entire population. The second thing that we could do is make a test. We could do a test to determine if there is a significant evidence that a claim about a population mean is true based on one sample taken from the population. So once again, a, a, the difference between a test and an interval is an interval just says, hey, I'm looking for the truth. Where a test says, you know, maybe somebody told me, maybe I, you know, some famous lion expert said that the average weight of all lions is 600 pounds. And, you know, I don't believe them. I claim it to be less than 600 pounds. So I'm going to have to use my sample as evidence to try to prove, to try to show that I really do think that the mean is less than 600 pounds. So, you know, like we've done that before with proportions. It's going to be a very similar idea with means. All right, next up, we can do a confidence interval to estimate the difference between two population means based upon two samples, one from each population. So maybe I wanted to say, hey, you know, um, what's the difference between the mean weight of lions and tigers? Man, I have no idea what it is. Lions are more, are they more or lions less? I don't know. So I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the difference. I'm thinking about what's the difference between the mean of all lions and the difference between the mean of all tigers. And boy, I have no idea. Um, maybe it's negative, meaning tigers are more. Maybe it's positive, meaning lions are more. I have no idea. So what I could do is I could take a sample of lions. I could take a sample of tigers, and I could use that sample difference from each population, from the two samples, to build a confidence interval for what the truth could be. And um, that's pretty easy to do, too. Um, the fourth and final thing we could do is a test to determine if there is significant evidence that a claim about the difference between two population means is true based on two samples, one taken from each population. So I know that it's a mouthful, so let me explain this. Let's say that some famous wildlife expert says that the mean weight of lions is um, equal to the mean weight of tigers. And I'm like, wait a minute, I don't think that's true. I've watched enough Lion King to know that lions are bigger than tigers. So my claim is that the mean weight for lions is greater than the mean weight for tigers. Okay. Well, now I have to try to prove this claim. I have to try to gather evidence, one from each population, a sample of lions, sample of tigers, to try to show that it is true that lions on average are more than tigers. And again, we already know all of these things. We've done confidence intervals and tests before. Now we're just going to apply them to means. 
But, 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 but know this, right? All of the things we just talked about, all four of those things involve samples, either one sample or two samples. So in any situation, we need to consider samples. But recall, a sample statistic by itself doesn't really tell you much. And that is why we must first consider how our sample statistic fits in amongst all possible samples. What point am I trying to make here? We're going to need sampling distributions. Absolutely, we're going to need sampling distributions. To do any of the four things we just talked about, we're, need, we're going to need to consider where our one sample fits in amongst all other samples. And as we learned throughout this lesson, you know I'm going to show you that. But there's one last thing to talk about. Once the confidence interval has been created and explained to estimate a population mean, there's always the possibility that the true population mean is not captured. It's just what happens. Maybe the truth is not in our interval. We're pretty confident it is, but you never know. And this is the idea of error. Or maybe once a test has been completed and a conclusion has been made about a claim, maybe that there's always a possibility that that wrong decision was made. So remember the other point of this video is to say that, you know, you should worry about error because at the end of the day, there's always a chance that you made, not that you made a mathematical error by any means, it's just that you made an error in the finding what you were hoping you were going to find. And we talked about type 1, type 2 error before, and you don't have to really worry about did you do it, did you not do it. It's also that we need to just consider, right? So not only do we have to learn about confidence intervals and tests, which we're going to do in this unit, we also need to learn about error as well. And, I, you know, I think that that's a great summary of what we're going to do in this unit and hope it's pretty easy and get ready to kind of, you know, fly through it. It's um, pretty easy, and a lot of kids actually um, understand proportions more because, all, you know, we're going to understand means, we're going to understand confidence intervals, we're going to understand tests, and the more that we focus on doing those things, the more it's all easy, whether you're talking about proportions or means. All right, that's it. See you guys in the next video.